Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to NACTA's virtual programming. I'm Bob Vecchioni, NACTA CEO, and we are pleased to bring you the next, next installment of this virtual programming series. Since we started these in mid-May, NACTA and all of our affiliate associations have provided in excess of 70 hours of professional development programming for all of our members. We are hopeful that this particular session will be one of the more enjoyable ones that we have done thus far. For, next, for several years, NACTA has been proud to offer additional professional deve development opportunities through the Senior Administrators Mentoring Institute to those members that are actively preparing themselves for the AD chair. This usually happens at convention, but as you know, with convention being canceled, we took this specific session with the specific speakers and had them on a virtual platform, which we are presenting today. There's no question that the search process can be overwhelming and an intense experience, but lessons from those that have successfully navigated this space can help each of you navigate this space when your turn comes to, um, to interview for a spot in the athletics director's chair. We're excited to have three phenomenal athletics directors with us today to provide their thoughts and guidance on how they navigated the process. And those three individuals are Pat Chung, Director of Athletics at Washington State University, Phil Eston, Vice President and Director of Athletics at St. Thomas University, and Marie Tuitt, Director of Athletics at St. Jose State University. Thanks to each of you for sharing your wisdom with us today. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this is an interactive session. So there is a button on your Zoom uh, screen that you can uh, add, uh, ask questions. We will leave time at the end of the session so that uh, your questions, as many as possible, will be answered by our uh, panelists. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor of today's session, Dynamic Pricing Partners, for their involvement. Partnering with over 75 sports and entertainment properties, Dynamic Pricing Partners are experts in pricing, predicting pace of sale, and distributing inventory across multiple channels. Their experience, technology, and data ensures their partners exceed their goals and maintain brand integrity across the platforms. For additional information on Dynamic Pricing Partners, go to their website, dynamicpricingpartners.com. That being said, I'll turn it over to Pat for introductions and take it away. Thank you again. Thank you, Bob. And uh, first and foremost, thanks, thanks to our friends at NACTA, Bob and Katie Newman for just working tirelessly to continue advancing our industry. Bob had used the term when we logged on earlier that mentorship is important. Uh, and especially during these times, uh, we all know the best way to improve our respective teams is to improve ourselves. Uh, on that note, I wanna thank everyone for logging in as well. Uh, this is, this is uh, the one thing about this stay at home time we've had in our industry. It really is a wonderful time for introspection and to uh, sh uh, sharpen your own sword and, and to work to, to really to go on a path to uh, study your profession and study yourself and try to be the best professional that you can be. Uh, so the way today's going to go, uh, hopefully uh, the, goal, the goal of our group today is really can we demystify uh, a little bit of the search process and dealing with search firms. Uh, ultimately going through any type of job search requires an incredible amount of introspection. I mean, these are, these are tough, uh, arduous processes that ultimately test every ounce of you uh, because, because there are so many nuances that go, on, uh, go into where you're at today and getting to the next step or to the end spot of your destination. Uh, so today, uh, our panel here, we're going to hopefully give you some good thoughts and some anecdotes uh, about dealing with search firms, going through a search process. Like Bob said, this is an interactive session, so uh, we're going to leave about 20 minutes for Q&A. Please feel free to fill up the chat with, with questions. Uh, don't wait till the end. Uh, if you feel, if you feel uh, inspired to ask a question, just put it in and we'll, and we'll get to it uh, as soon as we're done with our presentation. And um, with our esteemed panel today, I'm coming uh, to you from Pullman, Washington, uh, Marie from uh, San Jose, California, and Phil from St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, but it's a little, uh, it's really a, a nice little snapshot of 
how geographically diverse our industry is, uh, how, how important uh, it is for, for at least, I know for us to uh, enact the cause and ask you to make time for this. I know for all three of us, it's, a, um, it's an easy yes to, to do. So uh, I'm gonna pause right there and I'm gonna, we're gonna do some introductions, but uh, full disclosure before me and Phil go down this road, just so everyone knows, Phil and I actually started uh, really as on, on the, I wouldn't even say the, would you say the entry level fill or like the basement level of Ohio State in the mid 90s? So Phil and I go way back. I was actually in sports info, Phil was in events. Obviously, obviously uh, those, those are some fun days uh, at Ohio State, but Phil can, Phil can get you from his days at Ohio State uh, all the way to where he's at as AD at St. Thomas. Thanks, Pat. I appreciate that. We'll, we'll schedule another call for some of the stories back at, in our days in Columbus. Um, you know, I too want to extend my thanks uh, to Bob and NACTA for continuing to provide this important programming um, for all of us, really. I, you know, this is an opportunity, even as a panelist, to sit down and reflect a little bit of, about my time and my experiences and, you know, it makes us all a little bit sharper too. So I, I appreciate the platform um, and the format that, that, we're, uh, that we're able to, to do this in. So thank you for that. And I also um, do want to take a moment to acknowledge the emotions uh, that we're all feeling as a result of George, George Floyd's murder and the senseless death of others across our country. Uh, you know, athletics clearly plays an important role and has an influential role in our communities, in our respective communities. And, you know, I think it's our shared responsibility to listen and to learn uh, and to lead. And I ask all of you to lean into to outcomes with me. It's, it's something that's important for us. I know it's important for all of you. So um, let's lean into that as, as we kind of make progress into the future here. Um, so real quickly, I, I grew up the son of a, a college coach. My dad was a cross country and track coach. So had exposure to that at a, at a very young age with a student athlete myself, played baseball in college. And I think those things collectively helped to develop and kind of formulate my why. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. <clears throat> but, you know, I, I know that athletics truly made a difference in my life, has had a positive in, influence in my life. So kind of my career started with that foundation. I think that's really an important piece <clears throat> for all of us. As Pat mentioned, I cut my teeth in this uh, crazy business at, at Ohio State. Um, you know, a lot of great memories uh, from my years in Columbus as a graduate assistant, uh, received a master's degree there, worked um, ultimately then as an assistant director in, in ticketing and events. And, and, you know, it was really, a, I think it was a fun time to be part of, of the evolution and growth of Ohio State at that time. Um, and so a lot of great memories. Moved from there to the University of Minnesota, where I pursued and, and received a PhD um, started in the athletics department, helped to bring football back to campus, as we said at the time, building a new, <clears throat> the new TCF Bank Stadium on campus, moving out of the Metrodome <clears throat> and back to campus. And ultimately, uh, at the U of M, moved over to become president and CEO of the Alumni Association, just giving me, I, I think, a unique perspective on how athletics engages with the rest of campus and how, um, another piece I'll talk about later, athletics can serve as really a valued partner. Uh, to the broader campus community. Um, from there, uh, Sandy Barber asked me to join her at the University of California, Berkeley as her Deputy Director of Athletics uh, uh, for External Relations and Chief Development Officer. A uh, couple of great years at Berkeley, but when then, when then she moved to um, State College, uh, she asked me to join her as her Deputy Director of Athletics and Chief Operating Officer. You know, to me, that was, that was a great opportunity to step in and, and really think about the brand at Ohio State and what that turnaround might look like after, after a couple of year, difficult years that they had, um, 2011 and 12 and, and, and so forth. You all know the story there. And so, you know, that was, again, a really, I think, transformational time in my career um, as we were just kind of thrown into the fire a little bit to help kind of from a brand turnaround perspective. And then, um, and then the University of St. Thomas called and offered me the opportunity to come back to St. Paul as the Vice President, Director of Athletics. And, you know, I'm really looking at this um, some of you may know our unique story uh, at the University of, of St. Thomas, and I'm looking at it as a startup, and how do we really kind of make the transition into what's next for us, and, and it's really a startup opportunity. And, you know, the one thing I'll leave you with before I turn it back over to, to Pat or, or Marie here, um, you know, one of the things that I think all of us have really, um, really accepted in our career is that nothing's given to you and nothing, you're not entitled to anything. You have to be willing to do what others won't do. You have to be willing to do some of the things and step up and earn uh, your opportunities. And I, I think that's something that's a really important piece as you think about developing, um, providing opportunities to develop and developing into, into that next professional. 
uh, you're gonna have to earn it and you're gonna have to be willing to do some really hard things and, and kind of get to work on it. And so um, with that, um, I'll pass it back to you, Pat, appreciate it. And then I'll, I'll pass it right to, to Marie, my, my friend here on the West Coast. Marie, you wanna give, a little, give it one of uh, some of your background, your, some of your origin story? You bet, and thank you very much. I too wanna echo uh, how much I appreciate having the opportunity to, uh, to join everyone today. And you know, what's interesting is when Bob was talking about mentorship and giving back, just in the last few weeks, I've gotten to know Pat and gotten to know Phil a little bit better than certainly I would have had I not had this opportunity. So that sort of, you know, sort of exemplifies what athletics is all about. Um, and then Phil, I want to thank you for your words about what's happening in our country. Uh, not too far from where I'm sitting, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith statues, uh, are, you know, San Jose State, we're very proud. We believe social justice really began here a long time ago. And so I appreciate uh, those comments. Um, I've been at San Jose State for 10 years. I was the uh, deputy, uh, deputy director for seven years, and then I've been the athletics director for the last three years. Um, most of my experience has been at large state schools. I actually was at Cal Berkeley, uh, not during the time Phil was there, but certainly spent some time there. And then also I spent 14 years at the University of Washington, um, which was just a terrific experience. Um, I spent five years at the NCAA. I worked in championships there, which was great. I uh, had a terrific uh, opportunity working for the NCAA and then also spent some time at Seattle University. So I've had a broad spectrum of uh, experiences in a lot of different institutions. I was born and raised in Detroit, uh, one of seven children, a pretty typical Irish Catholic family. Uh, I was a little bit pre-Title IX, so didn't have some of the experiences uh, that some of my colleagues had as far as participating early in sport. But I grew up with four brothers, and if you want to learn how to compete, we have four brothers. Even today, when we have the uh, Greater Tulip Golf Open, you know, I'm in it to win it. You know, they better be bringing their A game because I'm not letting up. So I uh, did my undergrad and my graduate work at Central Michigan University, which... Uh, Hopefully everything will work out. And on September 5th, the San Jose Spartans will open at Central Michigan, my alma mater, which would be a real treat for me to go back to Mount Pleasant, Michigan. So really pleased to be here today and to share the, some information uh, with my fellow panelists. Thank you, Marie. And I'll give a, I'll give a, uh, um, I'll go into my background. I'm uh, a little bit, I guess, in, in a uh, unique Korean way. I'm the son of a coach. My dad was a, uh, uh, before he passed away, he was a 10th degree Taekwondo instructor, actually came to this country uh, in the late sixties to teach martial arts. I always grew up around sports, uh, was never really good enough to play at the highest of levels. Uh, but I'm, uh, we, my, I was, I ended up being born in Youngstown, Ohio, raised in Cleveland, uh, in the time I grew up, you have this great love of sports. You never get to see any of your teams win. Uh, I was one of those kids that wanted to go to the big land grant institution in my home state, and that was Ohio State. So uh, that's where I got my foot in the door. Uh, ended up uh, ended up really on the bottom. I started as a student employee uh, in the sports information office, and uh, spent the next 15 years of my athletic career growing up uh, uh, in many different ways uh, at Ohio State. Fortunate to work for. Uh, two of the greatest athletic directors in the history of our industry, Andy Geiger and uh, Gene Smith. And uh, I always tell everyone, uh, Andy gave me my start and, uh, and really switched me to fundraising halfway through my career or, or half, at a certain point in my career. And uh, the luckiest day of my career is when Gene Smith walked in the door because uh, to have a mentor that takes the time to teach you, hold you accountable, uh, push you is, is invaluable uh, no matter what industry you are in. Uh, you get, I got to myself to a place where I wanted to uh, get out of the comfort zone of Ohio State, wanted to challenge myself, wanted to put myself in uncertainty. Part of that's taken a huge step. Uh, I was fortunate that uh, I was able to take a job at Florida Atlantic University uh, down in Bo uh, Boca Raton, Florida. So uh, at least my family was happy they were going to be at a, around the beach. And uh, we had we had a lot of work to do to build up that athletic pro uh, program and uh, uh, ended up uh, leading me to an opportunity here at Washington State. I've uh, been here for two and a half years, surrounded by uh, uh, really a wonderful team of people here, serving an incredible group of student athletes, working really for an extraordinary president. But uh, just I'm, I'm one of those people that that really loves this industry, loves, uh, you know, love, you know, the, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so poignant what Phil and Marie talked about uh, relative to what's going on in our times right now and uh, the duty we have, the responsibility we have, uh, but really just just sometimes to sit back and listen and uh, uh, see how our student athletes react to this and making sure we give them the environment 
uh, to be able to impact like they want to impact. So these are these are challenging times, but yet really uh, emotionally charged fun times to be an athletic director because the challenge is different. Uh, you know, I've, I've used this line of heading into this fall if uh, name, image, and likeness and COVID-19 were going to be our two uh, great challenges that changed our industry. Uh, social justice now takes that, supersedes all that as it well should. Uh, so it's going to be a really amazing time of change for college athletics. And uh, like all of our campuses, the one thing that unifies all of us is we all know that student athletes always take a leadership role no matter what college campus they're on. So uh, it's up to us to make sure that the environment is conducive for, uh, for them to be the best they can be and impact people like they were supposed to impact. Uh, so with that being said, uh, when we met earlier, we decided that we we're going to try to divide this up into three buckets of how to become uh, of become an athletic director. Uh, one uh, was really discuss the roles that you're currently in, and really it's on the on the premise that you got to be great at what you're doing before you ever get an opportunity. I mean, uh, if you're if if you're going to go down this path, you better take a hard look in the mirror and figure out am I ready. Uh, the next piece was the interview process. Uh, which is uh, which is very uh, which is you talk about emotionally challenging uh, tests every part of you um, that is that is that is that is a, a a separate piece in the whole thing and then finally was how do you work with the search firms is is, is the last last piece that we want to talk about so I'm going to pass it to Marie because she's going to uh, she's going to dive into uh, really your current roles and how that helps you get ready uh, to make make a step yeah thanks Pat and yeah and when we had our pre-webinar meeting, we sort of talked about some things that when we were in the role of the deputy director, the senior associate director, what are some things that maybe perhaps we would have liked to have known before prior to starting the, the interview process? And that's how we decided to, to sort of organize our conversation. And if you're watching this and if you're participating today, it means that you're interested in learning. And I will tell you one thing, and I use this line all the time, the minute you stop learning, you stop leading. And um, and in your current role, and when I say deputy, I'm going to assume that I'm referring to the senior associates, the associates, anyone that's looking to sort of advance themselves professionally. And, um, and the other thing is um, some of what we say today, you've probably heard before, but you know, it's a, it's a little bit like uh, learning to shoot a free throw. You know, you have to do it a lot of times to finally get it down. So maybe some of the information we share today, you may have heard previously. Uh, and we also may share some information that maybe perhaps you don't agree. And, and I think that's okay. I think, um, I think if we all looked alike and talked alike and thought alike, I know we'd be bored and there'd be no growth and there'd be no movement forward. So I appreciate everyone being open-minded today and think about if, if we can present in this next you know, 30 minutes, a few takeaways for you that will help prepare you as you begin to engage in the search process then I think we would have you know, done our charge. Um, so starting today, and some of you I know already do this, but in your deputy role, you need to start thinking like an AD every single day. And you need to watch your AD and you need to ask yourself, what decision I, would I make uh, when you are noticing that your athletics director is sitting there trying to figure out which way to go, left, right, or straight? You have to ask yourself, what would I do if I was sitting in that athletics director chair? And I'll tell you this, I said, it used to be that leadership was about power and not anymore. You know, leadership is about heart and leading with your heart. And you need to be an empathetic leader and you need to be a servant leader. Uh, you need to be a good listener, which, you know, I've realized that that's something that I actually need to work on. I get a little impatient sometimes and kind of want people to speed up the conversation. And I'm realizing that I need to be a good listener. So as you are in your day-to-day -day life, looking at your athletics director and watching how she or him, how they go through their day-to-day -day decision-making, that will prepare you for thinking to be a leader when you have an opportunity to sort of sit in the chair. Um, I think the other thing too, and, and, and Todd Turner, one of my mentors, uh, you know, president of Collegiate Sports Associates, who's touched a lot of lives of, for those of us in athletics, you know, he used to say that who you work for is more important than where you work. And I think Pat and Phil would agree if all of us sat down and talked about all the many ways that our paths have crossed with the people that we have worked with um, and what we have learned from the people that we have worked with. Uh, you know, I can tell you right now, none of us are sitting in the chairs that we're sitting in without the support and help of the people that we worked for. And I believe, except for your family and maybe your loved ones, that that direct supervisor in some ways is the most important person in your life. 
uh, and he or she can have a tremendous impact on you. And I also, there may be some of you out there who are actually struggling with some of your relationships within your athletics department. And, you know, when I was younger, I always heard that, well, if you can't align with the athletic director, with the deputy or the senior associate, then you need to go. You need to go find a new job. And, you know, I don't think that anymore. I think if you find yourself and, and maybe you're not totally aligned with the vision and the values of the people that you're working with, I think you need to look at why. And I think you need to become a change agent and look at yourself and say, how can I align myself? Um, you know, people say all the time, well, you know, if they're not on board, go get another job. I don't believe that. And I will tell you this, some of the very best professional relationships you will experience are maybe those relationships where they started out and you had differing opinions or uh, it wasn't an environment where you could be collaborative and you could compromise. And so I would really encourage you in your deputy director role to make a decision today that you're going to work feverishly to figure out how do you get along with every single person that you come in contact with. And uh, I think that will really benefit you down the road. And I'll tell you right now, when you go to interview for an athletics director position, they're gonna ask you, tell us about some difficult times that you had to manage and how did you get through those difficult times? And uh, I think really focusing on the relationships that you currently are engaged in, in your current situation. And as Pat said, the very best job for you is the job you have right now, the very best job for you. And, and I'll be honest, I find sometimes uh, our younger generations, they're so anxious to get to the next step and they're so anxious to move on. And we certainly understand that. And I think all of us really embrace those individuals that, uh, that are ambitious and, and want to advance. But I'll tell you this, you better be doing the very best job you can right now for the person that you're working for, because again, he or she will have a, a tremendous impact on you. And then also, I think it's important in your current role to understand that, um, you know, as a deputy director, uh, and, and because I'm a female and because I'm an athletics director, I probably have more of a sensitivity reflex to perhaps the underrepresented groups that we work with in athletics. Um, and I guess I'll be pretty honest, I'm actually uh, embarrassed that my generation, uh, that we haven't done a, a, a good, a better job. I certainly know that there's been some growth and certainly at some, you know, division two or division three or some of the other FCS levels. But as you are in your current role, you have to have an empathetic reflex to those people that are looking to uh, move up in athletics and maybe perhaps haven't had the same opportunities that you've had. And so I think that's really important in your current role. Um, you know, I, I have some very strong women mentors. I have my, my go-to gal is, you know, Desiree Reed Francois at the UNLV, but I'm not sitting here if it wasn't for the men in my life that helped get me around the decision-making table that were, and in particular at San Jose State, if you look at Tom Bowen who hired me, and then I had the privilege of working for Jean Blaymeyer for five years, those men created an environment for me where I could learn and be prepared as I went through the process of engaging in uh, and interviewing to be an athletics director. And I think our current deputy directors and senior associates have to look at the folks that they are working with and so do athletic directors and make sure that we're uh, engaging and providing opportunity for, again, for those who maybe perhaps didn't have the same opportunity that you've had. So I would, I would leave you with that. And then also I would just recommend one of the things that I, I didn't underestimate it uh, when I became an athletics director, but I certainly didn't think about it as much when I was a deputy is how important campus engagement was for me outside of athletics. And uh, the people that work for me and I have some terrific uh, executive staff members, they know that we have a conduit to main campus. And if we want people to show up to what we're doing, and we ask a lot of people, we ask you to come to our events and we ask you to, to provide uh, you know, your hard earned uh, donor money. We ask to do a lot and then we have to make sure that if, people, if we want people to show up for us, then we have to show up for them. And to get engaged in selection committees on campus, to get engaged with other divisions on campus, I didn't think about that as much when I was a deputy and boy oh boy, now that I've been an athletics director for three years, 
it's one of the most important things and one of the most important focuses that I have is making sure that athletics is part of the entire fabric of the university. So I would encourage you uh, as a deputy to do that. So I leave you with um, a thought that I think all of us to our core are teachers. We are we're educators and uh, to remember that we're under the umbrella uh, of higher education and it's a privilege uh, to be a part of an athletics program. And uh, if you continue to do the right thing and work hard and hopefully your chance will come and one day uh, you may be doing a webinar for NACTA about being an athletics director. So thank you. Thank you, Marie. You made me think of something when I was when I was at Ohio State. <clears throat> Gene Smith actually made a group of us uh, uh, engage with campus. Uh, there were seven of us, and in that group, uh, Heather Light, who's at Pitt now, Martin Jarman, who's at UCLA. I think Chris Schneider was in that group, who's at uh, who's at the Big East Conference now. Uh, G, I mean, we literally met with the provost, met with uh, deans, met with the president, just talked about athletics impact. Because because you, you're right, you don't. Until you get to the chair, you have you really don't have a full. If you're a deputy and as the AD, you're immersed into campus, but uh, that silo is real. And if you don't go across campus and learn what is their view of athletics and how they impact your department, now is a great time to do it before you're in the chair. Because once it's go time, it's go time. You need to know before you get to the chair. You need to know what their roles are. And I think by nature, athletics is sort of located on the outskirts. You know, we need a lot of space. We got fields and stadiums and everything. And, you know, you're located away from campus at times. And that makes it even more important. If I had it my way, athletics would be right in the middle of the center of campus. Everything would circulate around athletics, but that's not how it works. And so you have to really be engaged and make an effort to make sure that you're going across the street or going across wherever to get and get engaged in what's happening uh, on campus. Thank you, Maureen. Now, Phil, you're going to take us through jumping into the arena and, and going to battle in the interview process. Yeah, I'm going to try. I've only been successful at it once, I suppose. But uh, you know what? Uh, you know, when you think about this, by, by the time you actually get to the interview process and the actual interview, I'm going to make some assumptions as I kind of talk through this. They assume that you've kind of gotten through some of the search firm uh, conversation and the screening of the search firm process, and maybe have even done um, a Zoom interview or a virtual interview to get yourself to the final um, three or the final six or whatever it might be. Um, and I think it goes without saying before I kind of get into this that you've got to do your research. Um, you know, you've got to have answers for kind of key uh, questions around current topics, whether, you know, today it's NIL or DEI, um, could be conference alignment or whatever it is happening at that particular institution. You've got to be prepared with, with things like that. Um, obviously research and get to know the committee members and just kind of the typical stuff um, that I think is really important. You know, a lot of people might stay up all night the night before kind of studying and crashing for it. And I think the best thing you can do is get some sleep, to be honest with you, so you feel fresh, make sure you have nourishment and, you know, eat well and all that kind of stuff so you don't crash throughout the day. But um, this is one of those things that a lot of people have different perspectives, I think, on how to make it through um, successfully kind of through the interview process. So I've narrowed it down to what I see as really three keys to success. Actually, some of it is pretty well aligned with what Marie talked about in terms of being a value add on, on, on campus. So I'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, but to me, the first is know your why. Um, if you, when you go into an interview, you, you can't fake it. You can't fake why you care about athletics. You cannot fake what your core purpose is. You cannot kind of just manage through superficially why you think you might good, be a good fit at that institution. And so you've got to be able to nail your why. And for me, I'll tell you, it starts with, um, and I want to just take a second to talk through this because it was helpful for me to think through it. Um, anytime that an, an opportunity has been presented to me um, or I've wanted to pursue an opportunity, my wife and I, Danny, sit down and we go through what we call four gates. Um, and we ask ourselves these four questions. And if we can walk through that particular gate or the answer is yes, then we'd pursue that, that opportunity. Now, I know you can't be too selective. There aren't a lot of these jobs, but for us, it's always been really important that we feel like we align really well with that institution. So the first is, you know, do we see ourselves there forever? Is this a place where we actually think we can be for a very long time? We have three kids. Um, it's important that we feel our kids would be um, you know, well, be a good fit in that community. We can see them graduating from high school there. We can see ourselves being involved and engaged in community activities and, and community service and volunteerism and maybe even retiring in that particular place. And if that answer to us is yes, then we walk through that particular gate. 
You know, the second is if things don't work out for whatever reason, the leadership change um, could be, you know, a, ch a change in the industry or whatever it is. Well, at least, will that opportunity at least present us with opportunities to advance beyond that. And so it's not necessarily leading us to, um, so to speak, dead end or whatever. It does provide some opportunities. And if the answer to that is yes, the next question for us is, do we see values alignment with that particular university and the leadership at that university? Um, values alignment between, you know, my wife and I and our, and our, and our values, my professional values. Um, and again, if the answer is that is yes to that, then the last gate for me to really dig into this um, is, do we see a commitment to and a history of, of success? Or, or you wanna know that the job you're walking into isn't, isn't setting you up to fail. Um, you want some demonstration that there's gonna be something there that is a, um, a partnership or a demonstration that there's a commitment to being successful there. So those, that's just, that's what works for me. It might not work for everybody those four particular gates, but I think it's important for you to really understand your why. Um, you know, your, your core purpose. Um, for me, having grown up in this industry, having been a student athlete and been around it for as long as I have, it's around create, you know, our job is to create conditions for success. We serve our student athletes. Um, and again, this might not be everybody's why, but we're there uh, to create those conditions so our student athletes can pursue comprehensive excellence. And, and I've got some foundations around what comprehensive excellence means to me. And that's really important. As I walk into this stuff, um, I want to have some structure and thoughts around what my core purpose is, what my why is, because again, I, I don't think that you can do that superficially or, or you can fake that. So know your why. The second um, is around a vision for adding value. Um, and, and I, I think it's really important that when you walk into these things, as, as Marie kind of alluded to and Pat talked about, you've got to demonstrate that you're going to be a, a key strategic partner on campus. And so how are you going to add value? And it's going to be different at every university. Um, every university might be looking for something slightly different as an outcome uh, from its athletic department. It could be adding value through culture, um, through brand extension and marketing, um, through winning and, and just having excellent teams on the field. Um, you know, in some places it might be around enrollment, uh, kind of enrollment strategy and enrollment management um, or extracurricular activities, uh, revenue generation and kind of philanthropic partner. What is it that you're going to do and bring that adds value to the institutional mission um, uniquely on that particular campus? And if, you, and if you have a good foundation of your why and you can communicate and demonstrate how you're going to add value to the campus, um, you know, I think that's, I think that's really important. You know, you're not going to have all the answers, nor should you. I, I think you, you want to come to the, come to that place and you want to be able to listen and learn a little bit, but have a vision for how you're going to structure a plan um, and develop kind of how you're going to add value to that particular institution. And then lastly, you know, I, I, people don't talk about this one enough, in my opinion, um, and I think an opportunity that goes drastically um, un kind of seized and unrealized is when you have the opportunity to ask questions of the search committee and of the university. Um, I actually think that's a really key strategic opportunity for you to show that you understand what's happening on that campus and for you to demonstrate that you understand how athletics can serve the university. Again, you're serving student athletes, athletes you're serving the university, you're there as a servant to all the various stakeholders. Um, you know, I think that only emerges to you after you've done really hard, deep research. You start to understand where kind of the gaps might be at the university and where you can help to fill some of those gaps. Um, and it helps to show that interest. So for instance, I don't think in an interview like that, it's the time to ask questions around what are the next steps from a timing standpoint? What's the compensation gonna be? Um, what does my staff look like? What, what are the facilities going to look like? Anything that appears to be self-serving, frankly, I think is off limits. I think one of the, one of the biggest turnoffs to me as I sit with candidates for any job, coaches, staff, whatever it is, either they don't have questions or they don't ask questions that demonstrate they care about being a value add to the broader department. And the questions are all around kind of them. Um, so for instance, a couple, I think a couple of questions yeah, I noticed a decline in students at large populations um, in, in key kind of demographic areas, gender, um, diversity, whatever it might be. How do you see athletics playing 
a role as a strategic partner in helping to kind of turn that around a little bit. Or another question that demonstrates an understanding of the broader university might be alumni giving um, to collegiate units is stagnated. I've noticed that that's kind of stagnated in certain areas. Do you see athletics serving as a gateway to help increase alumni engagement and campus philanthropy in any particular way? Again, how do, how do you kind of serve as the partner of choice or valued partner on campus? And I think asking key questions that kind of demonstrate that you understand how you can add value to that particular institution is a game changer. And too many people don't take advantage of that really unique opportunity. It might be 20 minutes where you can learn so much about what the job really is. You can dig in because that search committee is going to be faculty, um, might have a couple of coaches, but it's going to be um, might be a, a development officer on campus. It might be the alumni association director. You might have um, legal counsel. You might have HR. You might have the CFO. Um, and so their lens is broader than just athletics. For you to really get in their minds of how they're thinking about you as a partner, I think is super critical and important. So um, again, know your why, have a vision for how you can add value. And I really think you need to spend some quality time in developing strategic questions. So Again, high level, three thoughts, pass it over to Pat. That was great, Phil. And, and, I, and I'd like to stress what you had mentioned. Uh, you, you won't have all the answers, nor should you. And that is a key point because this is really about you knowing you and do you match up with the spec they put together on are you that person to lead their athletic department in the next phase and uh, knowing your why, having a vision, asking the right questions. I mean, that's how they're trying to ascertain, are you the right fit? That's right. Yep. So, Thanks. Fantastic stuff. So I'm going to jump into uh, working with the search firms and, and, and like, like Phil and Maria, this is just one person's viewpoint. So uh, not gospel by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, just some, some basic uh, guidelines that I use and uh, things I, I, I will tell our staff or people that reach out to me uh, for any, any type of mentor, mentorship or question. So uh, I think the most fundamental piece when you work before you even engage with the search firm, it, it's, it's, it's really goes with Maurice. I mean, it, it, I can't stress enough the things Marie and Phil said. One, you better be ready. I mean, there, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And your boss better think you're ready. Because if you're going to go after a job and your boss isn't an advocate for you, you're, doing, you're not going to get a job. There, there is no way. And two, you gotta be, you got to be interview ready. Uh, and, and there is no simulation for that other than practice. Uh, I was fortunate at, at Ohio State uh, uh, that Gene would, would he mock interview many of us. And I know he mock interviewed me, Heather, uh, Martin plenty of times and uh, to Gene's credit, I mean, he'll give you, he'll give you feedback you don't want to hear. Uh, but those are all the things that you need to hear uh, to help you be better at it. And you better have the right people. Cause I know uh, I'm guessing if I work for Phil or if I work for Marie and I said, Hey, can we carve out some time to, to, to mock interview me for a job? I promise you they'll move heaven and earth to make sure they get the right people in the room. As long as you're willing to take the feedback. I think that's the most important piece, no matter who your mentor is. If you're asking your AD for help, you've got to be willing to take the feedback and implement it. There is no worse feeling than when someone asks you for help, you give them the help, you give them the advice and they don't implement anything. Then it's just a wasted exercise for everybody. You, you Obviously, I wasn't the right person to give you help because you didn't take any of the advice. So you need to go find someone uh, that's going to help you with that. The other pieces, you got to make sure your resume is on point. And I always tell when I go with the play not to lose strategy with the resume, uh, your resume is never going to get you a job. Uh, but it is kind of a, a, a basically a background test uh, that you can put, put functional things on a piece of paper with no misspellings, no grammar mistakes, proper sentences, uh, to be able to just timeline or sequence what you've been able to do in this industry. I've seen, uh, we've all done it. We've interviewed coaches and staff members where there's a misspell uh, on, on, or, or something looks out of line in their resume. And you sit there and think, man, that's their level of attention to detail. Uh, and I'm going to try to win. And I need someone to, you know, all these positions, no matter if you're in events, sports information, fundraising, uh, sports administration, coaching, there's a level of detail that's needed that if you can't even uh, pay someone or, or have someone proofread your resume, I mean, that, that, that's unfortunately an indictment on you. So uh, although, although yeah, the resume is not going to get you a job, but it'll lose you a job if it's not on point. Uh, the next, so if you got all those things ready and if you think you're ready to go, I think the first step then really is you have to um, you have to communicate and identify who your advocates are going to be. I believe rarely in this industry uh, can you call a search firm and say I'm ready for this job. 
uh, it, it, you know, they're going to listen to your boss. You're going to listen to Phil and Marie. You need to know what they're going to say. They're going to listen to people that you've worked for in the past. Uh, they're going to listen to people that you've had deep relationships with. Uh, so you have to line up who your advocates are going to be. You need to find out what they're going to say. You also need to know how they're viewed and viewed in the industry as well, uh, because you may be close to someone and they may not, they not, may not be viewed in the greatest of light. Uh, or may have the greatest relationship with that firm. So you just need to understand all those things uh, because the, there are so many nuances in the search. Uh, but you need, to, you need to know who your advocates are and you need to know what they're going to say about you. I think we've all been in this situation where someone has called us and say, hey, will you, will you, will you endorse me for this job? And, and you know when they ask you that, it's like, man, they didn't even ask me what I'm going to say. Uh, and and that, that's always the next step because, you could, because we all have credibility in this industry. Uh, and it and and it and, and a part of our credibility is being truth tellers uh, with with people that we're friends with. I, you know, with Phil and Marie, if someone from our staff is applying for a job there, I owe it to them to tell them the truth or tell them a lot less than I would tell them from an HR standpoint, which sends up even a bigger red flag. So if Marie or Phil call me and say, "What do you think of so and so?" and I tell them, "Well, he or she's a good person," and leave it at that that's probably going to bring up more red flags than anything else. So you need to know what they're going to say about you before you do that. Uh, the second thing, the next thing is if you don't have relationships, uh, you need to start building relationships with all the key people in the search firms. But I would also ask you, I would also advise you, there's different ways to do it, but I think it's always easier if you had an advocate do the introduction, uh, simply because that, that'll just create uh, a common ground where you can go meet with them. And uh, relationships are critically important in this industry. It's, it, it's, it's like it's been said over and over. Relationships put you in these positions. You got to be aware of it. So whether it's Daniel Parker, Bob Bodine, Gene DeFilippo, Glenn Sugiyama, Ted Turner, Chad Chatlos, or Todd Turner, uh, the, uh, um, you have to have relationships with them. And all of these, all the firms are at conventions. Uh, I would even advise people if you're, if you're deep into the process uh, or deep into where you're at in your career, it may be worth your time to, to go visit them and spend time with them at their offices. Uh, just to get to know them. You have to have relationships. Uh, I'll push our deputy ADs. I know we have three here uh, that, that aspire to be athletic directors. It's, it's my, you know, if, if I didn't have an AD that didn't push me to do those things, I don't think I would be here. Uh, so I, so uh, as, as we pass on knowledge in our industry, it's important for me to, to push these guys to make sure that uh, they are building relationships with these search firms because you just, they need to know who you are before they advocate to you. So schedule time to get to know them, go to their office, meet them, meet with them at conventions, also stay in contact with them. Uh, it's the power of text messages, the power of a thank you note, just make sure you do all these touches with them. Uh, and then when a job opens, just be conscientious of everything that was said earlier. Every search is different because every job is different. Uh, and, and really, as you go through, when you engage with these firms, you got to understand there's uh, someone gave me this advice really early on that uh, when a job opens up and you think you want it, uh, there's really two searches going on at the same time. There's a search that the institution's doing to go find the best candidate. And there's a search you have to go do to try to get yourself into the mix uh, to go compete for the job. I know Gene used to always say, uh, don't worry about uh, the offer, just worry about get, you know, getting into the mix and try to go compete for a job that you want. So I always tell people, you got to look at it in three specific stages. No, number one is how do you get involved with the search, which is, which, which is, which is uh, a challenge in itself sometimes because you need people advocating for you uh, to get into the search. The second piece, like Phil mentioned, is winning the interview. Uh, because I always tell, I, I tell people when they go through the process, and for those of us who've been through many processes, uh, uh, to be on the losing side of it is not fun. Uh, it, it tests every ounce of you to get there. So I've always told people you need to be able to go in there and just focus on winning the interview because we all know there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of nuances that go into who gets the actual job offer. You may so the only thing you can control is can I kill that interview and can I walk out of that room knowing that I was prepared and I won the day. And you need to be at peace because the committee may think there's a better fit. There may be an existing relationship that outweighs you as the best interviewee for that job. Those are all the parts of, of, of competing for these types of jobs. So uh, I always said, just focus on the interview. Don't focus on the result. Just be able to walk out of the room, know that you did your best. Uh, someone gave me advice when, you, when you're done with an interview, make sure you write down all the questions uh, just so as you, as you keep going through this uh, process that you have kind of a baseline of notes uh, that you can go back to and just re-strategize re how you're gonna answer questions like, like, like Phil, Phil, had, uh, Phil had spoke to about earlier. So uh, hopefully all of this was some, some good advice. Hopefully he had some takeaways. I'm gonna jump to the Q&A piece right now. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, just load them in there. We'll try to get to as many. I see we have nine. Uh, so I will start with number one here, and it's from 
Jeffrey Merrill, how do you suggest someone at a smaller institution to begin being noticed to get into the AD role? So, I, I, well, I guess my, my first reaction, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll let Phil and Marie answer. My first reaction is I don't think it, well, I don't know if it matters if you're at a smaller institution or not. I think it goes back to what Marie said, you better be good at your job and you better start building some relationships. So whether you're at the biggest of big schools and smallest of small schools, it still comes down to, are you, are you, are you a high achiever, a high performer in your, in your athletic department uh, that, show, that proves to people, proves to your boss that you're upwardly mobile? I just want to real quick add on to what Pat said about uh, I mentor, I was mentoring a, a young man and he wasn't getting any looks and he wasn't getting in, into any of the uh, search process. And I asked one of the search firms because I thought he was terrific. I said, what's the deal? He's not getting in the game. And they said, he's got no champion. He's got no advocate. No one's picking up the phone. And when the three of us are calling for someone, we don't say, you know, we want you to hire such and such. We say, we'd like you to take a really good look at their application materials. Or if I had an opening, I would seriously look at this candidate. You know, that's how we are advocates. But if you don't have champions, it's not just like Pat said, it is not gonna happen because it's so relationship based and people hiring is when I got asked, what's the hardest thing I do? And I said, well, the hardest thing is the most important thing and it's the people we hire. Cause you either solve problems or you create them when you are hiring. And so because it's such a crucial uh, charge for the president, the more champions you have that they can get a sense of what you're like, the better off you'll be. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add, because I agree with both Pat and Marie, the only thing that I would add um, is just a little bit of a cautionary tale to not feel like you're chasing everything that might be open. And this isn't a direct answer to that particular question, but there certainly are people that have a reputation in our industry for chasing jobs versus trying to find the right fit. Um, and so, you know, I, I think really understanding who you are and as, as Pat and Marie said, both demonstrating value where you're at and, and doing, being really good at your job and then also creating really key relationships in the industry. Um, but being, I, I, I know it's hard, but you've got to be selective in the jobs that you pursue to make sure that it's, a, it's kind of the right move because you certainly don't want that reputation of being seen as like a job seeker, climber kind of a deal. So the next question I won't answer because I don't have any of these types of experiences, but to any of the panelists, uh, this is from Joe Bond. What are your thoughts about someone hoping to fill an AD position developing experiences at the professional sports level? Are there comparable skills, traits that you believe can be obtained with perhaps less time in college athletics, athletic department positions? Phil, thoughts? At least you were an alumni association, so you were. Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll say this. The, one of the great things about being in the alumni association was, for me, um, being able to kind of, people judge you on your, uh, you judge yourself on, how, on your intentions, and other people judge you on your actions and your words. And so when you leave athletics and you're in another role, so if you're at, you know, professional athletics or for me in the alumni association, I was able to really look at athletics to, through a different lens. And I know what I intended, the kind of partner I intended to be when I was in athletics. But when you step away from it, you start to see how others might perceive athletics. And I think it actually gives you a really unique um, perspective on how athletics can add value to the rest of the campus. And, and that's, I mean, that's a big key for me is about being a value added partner. Um, and so, you know, I think there are a lot, there are clearly a lot of similarities between professional and collegiate sports. There are also a lot of differences between the two. Um, and so I think just finding those things where you've added value, where you've been a great um, kind of employee, you've dug in on your job, but also you might have a unique perspective on the role that that particular department can play in the community, having come from professional sports. And I think anytime you can provide that unique perspective, it might be helpful. And I think you need to take a really, you know, we kind of call it this toolkit. I think you need to take a really good look at your skill set and determine which of those skills are transferable. Because no matter what role you're in, you've got to have a certain skill set in order to be successful, whether it's revenue generation, conflict resolution, uh, developing relationships, good communication, organization. It doesn't matter what you're doing. So sort of take a look at what your current skill set is and are there areas that depending if you're going to go professional or professional to collegiate, what are some of the areas in which you need to develop more transferable skills? Our next question is from Randy Handel, two-part question. When a search committee reviews candidates to select a new AD, number one, 
What attributes do you feel are most important to their selection process? And two, what was your attitude going into the interviews as to what you wanted to accomplish? When you guys want to take a stab at number one, what attributes do you feel are most important to their selection process? Well, I, I know when I do hiring, it was interesting. If, you know, if I'm hiring a coach and you get all kinds of advice, you know, are you going to hire someone who's running this kind of offense? They're running this kind of defense. They've got this recruiting base. I go, nope. Number one priority for me is a good moral compass. By far, I start there. And uh, when you look at what attribute can you bring in, in, in to the interview process, you better have a good moral compass to start with. Phil, anything to add? No, I, I would just agree with that. I, you know, I, I think part of what I spoke about, know your why, really show value, um, and then be thoughtful about how you can demonstrate you understand broader campus are the three things that I would that I'd probably emphasize. I'll, I'll add with the second part was what was your attitude going into the interview as to what you wanted to accomplish. I go back to you just want to be able to walk out of there and win the day. Actually, my wife had, had me do this. Uh, as, as odd as this may sound, she had me start reading The Man in the Arena by Teddy Roosevelt before I go in. Uh, just as a reminder, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, glory goes to the person that is willing to go into the arena and fight. And, yeah. and go try to do get out of their comfort zone and make themselves vulnerable because it isn't these are tough processes and uh, you just, at the end of the day the attitude for me is always hey I'm going to go in the arena I'm going to do my best but as long as I can walk out of that room uh, know that I gave my best and I'll, I'll I can live with that. Yeah. Uh, next question: I graduated from Springfield College's athletic administration graduate program. While I'm just beginning to enter this career path, I still was able to relate a lot to the information you all spoke about to my current role. So thank you. I want to ask. While this is not the main topic of today's talk, do you have any advice for those younger just starting out, especially during this pandemic? Tough time to start a new job. I know that much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll just mention real quickly, I'll go back to what I said earlier, kind of in my opening remarks. I, I think you've got to demonstrate that you're willing to do some things that other people aren't. Um, to me, work ethic is really important and work ethic actually means different things to different people. And I respect that. Um, but if you can show that you're willing to do kind of the extra thing and, and you, you can do that with initiative, I don't have to ask you to do it. Um, that goes a long way to me. And so being willing to do some things that others just aren't willing to do, um, I, I think is, is a good start. I think too, um, and, and I'll tell you, you know, jobs are hard to get. I mean, it's not easy to get jobs and especially with the pandemic and everything. So again, you really have to have some people that are championing you that can pick up the phone or send an email, especially otherwise what comes across the desk is what we call a cold file. You know, we don't know you, we don't know anything about you. And so as you're looking at those jobs, uh, the more uh, conduits you have to the universities and the colleges that you're applying to, the better chance you might have of, of getting a look. And I'll repeat what what Pat said too, I mean, your job is to get into the hunt. That's what you want. You want to get, you want somebody to listen to why you think uh, you would be a good fit for whatever institution you're applying to. And that should be your, your goal is to try and at least get to that table. Uh, it's not easy to do uh, because, you know, in any job, if, if Bill has a job opening, you know, he'll have 75 people applying for the job. So if not more in certain, in certain positions. So uh, but if you can figure out your champions and figure out some kind of connection to where you're applying, you'll have a better chance. There's a follow-up question. How can you add value without having much experience in the industry? Uh, I'll just add to this. I mean, I have, I, Phil probably doesn't remember this, but it had to have been like the 98 or 99 Big Ten Baseball Tournament. Uh, we, you know, we had tons of rain and Phil and I were the last two people. <laughs> we were the last two people to leave the, uh, the ballpark. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, we were the first two people there. Uh, and I know Phil's got a dog at home that he let out. <laughs> so, uh, so there was, uh, that's how you add value. I mean, you do your job at a high level, you stay committed to it. Uh, those are habits at the end of the day. Cause I promise you now uh, at St. Thomas, if there's a baseball game and there's bad weather, Phil will probably be the last one to leave that ballpark and he'll be the first one uh, in the next morning. And those are things that you had. I mean, those are habits that you have to have. Yeah, yep, I, I agree. agree. Uh, great idea on engaging on campuses from Javier Smith. How do you athletic department and how do athletic department employees find time working directly with student athletes is a 24 seven job. Should ADs or deputy ADs mandate times for athletic department employees to get involved through campus committees or task forces. Well, and I, there's a lot of things you can do uh, to support efforts on campus. You can go to speakers, you can go to performances, 
You can send email when somebody gets hired. I mean, there's countless things that you can do that don't actually mean presence. But then there's also the thing, when my president, uh, when she had her investiture, if you weren't in class and if you weren't at practice, you were at the student athlete coaching staff, you were at the investiture. And the entire football team was there in their jerseys. And that showed the university of the support of athletics to efforts on campus. And so there are countless ways in which you can do that and still do your job, which is 24 um, seven. I don't think, I don't think your current position should prevent you from getting engaged with campus. All right, we got about five minutes left. So I'm gonna jump, I got Rob Clark. So he's trying to impress his boss Marie here, uh, <laughs> question. Uh, what are one, two, one or two pieces of, advice, pieces of advice you would give your past self when you were a deputy? I'll, are you I, asking, yeah, you let, let Pat and Phil ask. I'll tell you later, Rob. Which, by the <laughs> way, Rob Clark, my deputy, awesome. He's, he's the best. I mean, I, I think in hindsight, if I knew how invaluable it was to keep things off your AD's desk, I would have done, although I thought I did a good job at it until you're in that chair, you have no idea the, the, the amount of, like if you can help your AD stay focused on the most important issues and try to keep the things that you can solve yourself or you can get the right people to solve, you will infinitely make your athletic department better. There are, there are a thousand things coming at the AD uh, every single day and, and I'm lucky. I got a staff here that uh, sometimes you feel I walk away out of our meetings thinking I've done the less, least amount of work to figure, figure out a problem, but at the end of the day, um, I mean, that, that's where your value, that, that's where I think you impact others. Phil? Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I received some advice um, a couple of years ago that I wish I would have um, thought about sooner, and that's develop your own and identify your own personal board of directors. Uh, people who care about you as a person who really understand who you are and what your values are and lean on them and listen and be open-minded because they're not going to be afraid to be honest with you. Um, and I think that that's been really helpful for me um, to maybe let, let my guard down a little bit, um, know and accept that I don't have all the answers. None of us can do this alone. We really need help to kind of get to where that is. Um, and I wish I would have taken that advice sooner in my career um, because I think it would have made me better at my job sooner in my career. And so I'd just say kind of try to develop your own personal board of directors that helps you and it's going to be honest with you, guide through, navigate through some of this stuff. So we're running out of time here. So uh, we're going to kick it. Uh, we'll kick it back to Bob Vecchioni. Um, but maybe if we have a second, maybe we have a closing. Do you have any closing pieces of advice uh, for the group here? We'll start with we'll start with Phil. Quick one sentence closing piece of advice. Just, you know, I, I think when you're getting into this, you just have to be yourself. Again, I've, I've said it, I said it earlier, you can't fake it. Um, you can't kind of fake your way through this process. You really have to be true to who you are and, and what you care most about. Marie? I would say, remember, servant leadership, lead with your heart, be empathetic, um, think like an AD, align with your AD, help those who perhaps uh, haven't had the same opportunities you've had. I'll just throw in here, like any great professional, study your craft, read D1 ticker, read books, talk to people, study who the who are the people you admire in, in the industry. Everyone's on a different path, but you have to study your craft. But like any great coach, you have to study your craft to get better at it. So uh, thank you guys for your time. Bob, thank you on behalf of our group. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, this has been a fun hour for us. Yeah, Pat, uh, thanks. Um, uh, great job quarterbacking, Phil Marie. Uh, Great information. Uh, you know, I know a lot of notes were taken and uh, really a, a great platform and a great foundation for a lot of young people taking good notes and, uh, you know, learn from the experts. They've all sat in, they've sat in every chair imaginable coming up the food chain. So uh, thank you so much. And Katie Newman, great job again. Thank you for putting this all together. And uh, to everybody out there, uh, be safe and have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.